So hello, um, welcome to another class. General ideas, today I'm gonna to talk about the exam. You have an exam on Wednesday, April 7th. That's this upcoming Wednesday from to starting at noon. It'll open up at noon and close at 1.05, just like last time. In fact, it's basically, the setup is the same as last time. I'm not gonna bother opening up on Vanco Hall or anything. It's the same setup, um, 12 to 1.05. Um, and uh, the general idea is I was going to go through last semester's exam, and as I go through last semester's exam, give some hints, tips, tricks, and whatnot. Talk about what you need to know. Um, sound good? Any questions about the exam in general before I get started? Let's do it. Now, um, there will be some constants given at the beginning. Since you're not going to get it in this form, it's going to be in Vanco Hall. Um, they'll just be on the first page in Vanco Hall. Uh, but there will be some constants given. Keep in mind, um, you're going to be doing everything on paper, taking pictures and uploading it. But I'll just get it. The first page of problems will all be Chapter 5. Chapter 5 was all about temperature and heat. Uh, the type of things you need to know from chapter five is all written in the upper left version of the screen right now. And like last time, there will be some problems that are more multiple choice slash open-ended and some problems that will be more mathematical. And the first problem last time says, which of the following does not happen when a metal increases in temperature? What we talked about is that when a metal increases in temperature, we talked about how it grows bigger. That means its volume increases. But let's think about this. If something's volume in decreases, density is mass over volume. Uh, if something's volume increases, that means its density decrease. Sorry, if it's volume. I have a long thing here. If, oh yeah, it's not. If something's volume increases, that means its density will get smaller. That means its density decreases is also true. Uh, electrical resistance changes. We'd mentioned that in class. It's way common thermometers work. That also changes. The mass does not change. That's a lot of conservation of mass. Something's mass can never be changed. And since the answer is A, B, and D, all three of those are not true. Um, Sorry, I, oh, sorry, A, B, and C, sorry, A, B, and C are all true. I misspoke, or A, B, and D. That means C is not, mass is the conserved. Sorry, I misspoke, because I, I forgot there was a not here, and I confused this myself here. Yay, hey, I'm an idiot. And so the answer must be C. It must be C, the mass increases. Because that's the one thing that isn't true because mass is conserved, it never changes. When you change temperature, your density changes, your volume changes, and your resistance change. Um, the next problem, how much energy does it take to bring a teapot of water from room temperature to 85.9? To something changing temperature will be on there. It might be water changing temperature, it might be something else. But either way, it will be how much heat is required to change the temperature of an object. When I do this, if there's no phase change, it'll be heat equals MC T final minus T initial. If I give water, I will not give the value of C because the value of C was given up here at the beginning for water. If I give something else, I'll tell you what C is. And what is it? There's no phase change. It's just going to be the mass, um, 0.71 kilograms times C, which I can go back to that table for 186 kilogram um, joules per kilogram degree Celsius, and the final temperature minus the initial, 85.9 degrees Celsius minus 20 degrees Celsius. And I'll just do that math. However, this one had no phase change. I usually try to work a problem without a phase change and one with a phase change. If I do one with a phase change, you're going to want to have this chart with you. 
I highly recommend just, yeah, having this entire chart accessible on the quiz test. You don't want to have to spend time opening everything up. I would make an equation sheet, just having a few equations in front of you, but have this in front of you too. You see where this last problem said there was no phase change. This next one has one. And it says how much heat is needed to turn 1.35 kilograms of water at 32.4 to steam at 165. What that means is we'll find the heat required to take water, which is in this region, to steam that's in that region. We want to know how much water, and we're going to have to break it up. If we want to turn water at 32.4 to steam at 165, we're going to do this in three steps. The first is water at 32.4 to 100 degrees. That's as hot as water gets, so that's all I'm going to use there. The second section, will be to boil the water. And the last section is once we turn our water into steam, that's the boil water, we have to do steam at 100 degrees to 165 degrees. And for each of these, they'll just get their own equation. And I'm just going to use the table I put up in the upper left corner for the first bit. Q is going to be the mass, 1.35 kilograms, times 4186, times 100 minus 32.4, which I can do that math and get 38, 2014. A common mistake here is people forgetting this temperature cutoff. Make sure that, you know, water is only water from zero to 100. If we're less than zero, that's going to be the cutoff. If you're going above 100, that's going to be the cutoff. To boil the water, Q equals ML. Or looking at the thing, 1.35 times 2.26 times 10 to the 6, which is... 3.051 times 10 to the 6 joules. For steam, equations right there, we have M times the value for steam. If you look at that table up there, the value for steam is 2010. And it's going up to 165, but we're starting at 100. We're starting at 100 because that's the coldest steam can be. Once I have all these values, I'll just add them up. I'll just say this number plus this number plus this number, and I'll add them up. And get a value. Now, that one, um, it's probably going to show up in some form. I might go water to steam. I might go ice to water. If I go to ice to water, it's the same idea. You just do a cutoff at zero. Once again, I don't give the constants for water, but it was up on the first page, which once again, you don't look like this on the exam where you get it, but it will be on the first question in, um, in the online exam. Any questions? Now, I do like to do problems that involve, you know, not math. I've said that before. Um, one of the things I often ask about is mechanisms for heat transfer. In this last time I said a gas stove works by heating air around a flame, which rises and heats the pan. What's the mechanism of heat transfer? That right there is convection. Conduction is the mechanism of heat transfer of things touching. Convection is from the flow of air. Radiation is due to light, basically. Um, I might ask them about, heat, about those. Now, in general, for the Chapter 5 problem, and I know I have one left, I'll do it in a second. For the Chapter 5 problems, really, you can definitely expect the Q equals MCT final minus T initial. One with just a simple change, maybe water, maybe not. One with a complicated change. 
like these guys. Um, what world questions I'm going to do, I could do a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I sometimes though do um, unit conversions, convert this temperature in Celsius to Fahrenheit, convert this temperature in Fahrenheit to Celsius. So that is also a possibility. But the other thing that basically always shows up is something with the ideal gas law. What I asked last time was I said in the movie Up, Carl Fredrickson flies away in his house attaching thousands of helium balloons. Assume the balloons are at room temperature. Um, and have a pressure of 1.01 times 10 to the fifth pascals. It would take 1.06 times 10 to the 30th hel helium molecules. What is the volume? Now, anytime you see something with a number of molecules, anything, if a number of molecules shows up at all, that's going to be ideal gas law, where the ideal gas law is PV equals NKT. Keep in mind, you will need Boltzmann's constant, but I can just scroll up to the last page and say, But if I ask you for number of molecules or give you number of molecules, that's going to be the equation every time. We haven't done number of molecules for anything else. Now, two things to be careful with. Well, one thing to be careful with ideal gas law. I mean, this is how you solve it. PV equals NKT. One thing to be careful of is this temperature needs to be in Kelvin because this right here is in Kelvin. Any temperature I give you for the ideal gas law, add 273 and convert it to Kelvin. This is the most common mistake. But if I want to solve for volume, I'll just divide both sides by P and I can plug in N K sub B T over P. And that'll give me a value. Any questions? So that's the first page. Once again, the first page, expect there should expect to definitely see these. And the other two will be some mixture of other things. I have a question. Yeah. Um, for number four, you said, you know, where would you find that one? Like if you didn't know, like would it be in the side somewhere? It's in the chapter five notes. I went through the mechanisms of heat transfer. Conduction, convection, radiation. Those are the three mechanisms of heat transfer. All right. Thank you. Bye -bye. Just like last time, I will grade with partial credit, by the way. Um, I have my grading rubric in front of me, and like all of these were broken down to give partial credit for various things. It's normally three for the equation, two for the answer, but that doesn't really work for like that multiple step one, where this was just one for one equation, one for the other equation, one for knowing the cutoff values. But I will make sure I give heavily partial credit like last time. Okay. The second page will be chapter six. I don't know why that line is so thick, which was all about waves. There will be some questions that um, are mathematical, some that aren't just the same way. Last time the first question was, um, let me, what type of wave occurs when a string of fixed length and tension vibrates at the national frequency? That's a standing wave. Know your types of wave. I often ask things. Standing is a wave that looks like it's in place. Uh, traveling wave is one that's moving across. Traveling waves can be longitudinal or transverse. Know those terms. 
What almost always comes up though, is something with this equation right here. And equation seven says the five gigahertz band of Wi-Fi is so named because the information is sent using radio waves, a type of electromagnetic waves with a frequency of five gigahertz or five times 10 to the ninth hertz. What is the period of motion of a wave? Now the equation I have written above, let's switch colors so you can tell what's what, is frequency is one over period. But that is the same thing as period is one over frequency. Anytime I ask you for anything with period, and this often comes up, if I ask you about period, it's just the inverse of frequency. That will be the equation. And so if it's a five gigahertz wave, wave it'll just be one divided by five gigahertz. Five times 10 to the giga is nine. Okay. Sorry, I boxed a different equation. I said this equation would definitely show up and I boxed and it wasn't that one. I used this equation. I assumed the next one was gonna come up. This equation will probably come up too. What I originally said is this guy would definitely show up. And I thought it was gonna be question seven and it wasn't. I should probably read what I'm doing. Question eight is using it though. If I ask anything relating wavelength and frequency, it'll always be this equation. And what I said here is giving the information from number seven, what is the wavelength? See, we know that velocity is frequency times wavelength or wavelength times frequency, or it doesn't matter. And you're looking to say, cool, what is the wavelength that has the equation? I told you the frequency. What I didn't tell you was the speed. Depending on what type of wave I give you, I might give you a speed or I might instead not give you a speed and simply say it's an electromagnetic wave. If you have an electromagnetic wave, the speed of any electromagnetic wave is just the speed of light. And so if I say it's an electromagnetic wave, I will not give V because I expect you to know that is what V is. And if I want to get the wavelength, I'll just divide both sides by the frequency. And just say it's 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second over 5 times 10 to the 9th hertz, which is 0 0.0600 meters. Um, other thing that basically always shows up is something with Doppler, or not Doppler, sorry, I misspoke, something with decibels. Decibels will show up in some way, shape, or form. I'll either tell you how many times louder something is, or I'll say how many decibels something is, and I'll ask for the other one. Last time I said the noise of launching SpaceX Falcon Heavy was said to be 10 to the 16 times the limit of human hearing. How many decibels is that? Well, here I said it is 10 to the 16th. So I'm just going to say, take that 16. If it's 10 to the 16th, that means it's 16 bells. But really, I don't give a shit about bells. What you should do is you should take that exponent and multiply it by 10. 10 to the 16th is 16 decibels. I sometimes do go the other way. I might say something is 160 decibels. How many times louder is that? If you do that, drop the zero off the end and do 10 to that number. Okay. And the last one last time was the blank effect is when someone observes a wave frequency different than that was produced by the source due to the relative speed between observation, ob observer and source. That's the Doppler effect. That was a D, but it looks like a B to me. Doppler spelled ho like looks horrible. Um, that's just another text one. I often do ask things about the Doppler effect. I often ask how the frequency would change if you're getting closer or further away from something. Um, once again, it's hard for me to tell you what to expect on the non-math ones because I can change it up. But definitely know how to do this type of stuff, how to go between decibels and um, times louder. 
and definitely be ready for these two equations. Dr. Oz? Yeah. Um, so number nine, you said, you said there's another equation might be like drop in the zero. Or I what? might go the other way. Instead of saying 10 to the 16th and the answer being 160, I might give you 160 and want 10 to the 16th. Oh, uh, so, okay, it would be the opposite. Okay, thank yeah. you. Any other questions? The third page will be from chapter seven. And chapter seven, I could tell you exactly what four of the problems are going to be. I'll tell you exactly. But before I get let's do the first problem. The first problem on here will be one of two things. It will either be Snell's law for the angle of reflection, or what are three things? The law of reflection or the index of refraction. It'll be one of these three things, the first problem. I will either get put refraction through material and ask you to find the angle. There's one like that in the homework. I'll ask, I'll, the first problem in the homework is law of reflection. I could do something like that. Or last time I did the index of refraction. I said, given that the index of refraction of a certain type of glass is 1.5, what is the speed of light in that material? Index of refraction is defined as the speed of light divided by the speed of light in a material which means rearranging the speed of light in a material is the speed of light in a vacuum over the index of refraction. And so the speed of light in a material is just gonna be the speed of light in a vacuum, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second divided by N. If I do something with n, it's probably going to be, I mean, I never do the exact same thing next time, so I probably wouldn't ask for c of m, but if I do one of these, it would be I'd have you solve for n. What's c divided by c of m? As I said, I could also, do, I very seldom do law of reflection, mostly because law of reflection is way too simple. But if I do Snell's law, look at the problem on the homework. Just, you're going to go and solve for an angle using a index of refractions. What's going to come after that, though, is problems 12 and 13 will be about a mural. Problem 14 and 15 will be about a lens. That's what's going to happen. I'm going to ask you to draw lens diagrams and mirror diagrams. So let's go through. Now, for the mural, I might do concave. I might not do convex. Make sure you know which one's which. And you will need a ruler. You will be drawing this. Last time I said, draw a ray diagram for a concave mirror. Okay, does it either way for a mirror? I'm just going to draw a curved line. And for a mirror, I will always give the value of C. C is how far away from the mirror to the point C. Wow, full? Is that means I went long. And I will usually, that's really what I give you. Now, for a mirror, you also need the point F. Where, the, where to find F is just half of whatever C is. And so if C is at four centimeters, F is at two centimeters. And I normally give D sub zero. D sub zero is where the object is. What you're going to do is you're going to find that spot and draw a little arrow. Well, the height of the arrow just needs to be smaller than the mirror. Now, this, I already jumped to the thing. I put this arrow here because it's a concave mirror. For any concave mirror, make sure the arrow is on the same side as the mirror as F and C. If I instead said it was a convex mirror, if this was a convex mirror, D sub O would have been out here somewhere. For a, con for a concave mirror, put the D of O near F and C, the same side as F and C. For a convex mirror, put it outside. That's important. And either way, what you're going to do is you can just make the lines. The lines for a mirror will be one line that goes straight across from the mirror to, or from your point to the mirror, and then goes through F. The other line is going to go from the top 
and go through C. Wherever they meet, I want you to draw your image. This was a common mistake on the one so far, where you draw an arrow starting from the principal axis to where they meet. That is my image. And that is what I want to create chapter number 12. Now, once again, I might do might be something similar, It'll be different numbers. I might do convex. If I do convex, this, this orange arrow would have been over here somewhere. Um, but there will be a mirror diagram. Question 13 is going to be about that mirror diagram. And so I said for number 12, was it real or virtual, magnified or reduced, inverted or upright? For a mirror, mirror is real anytime the image is on the same side as the object. And is virtual anytime the image and object are on opposite sides. This right here is real because the image and the object are on the same side of the mirror. As for the rest, take a look. If I go by the line of paper, my original thing was only one line big. And this guy's about two lines big. It got bigger. It got bigger means it's magnified. Before this pointed up, now it points down. It switched which way it pointed. This is inverted. Questions on that? Dr. Lars, what's magnified again? It's bigger. The blue arrow is bigger than the orange angle, so it's magnified. If the blue arrow was smaller than the orange angle, it would be reduced. Sound good? Sounds good. Okay. Now that's 12 and 13. 14 and 15 will be a lens diagram. And for a lens diagram, I will either do a converging lens, which is shaped like this, or a diverging lens, which is shaped like that. I don't necessarily care if you have the shape right, but how you draw the lines has to be right. I last time asked for a diverging lens. There's my diverging lens. And I'll give a point F. Now, the, for a lens, you normally look through a lens. You normally have your object over here and you're going to some focal point there. But you'll notice for this diverging lens, I gave a negative focal length. That can for you a, move the paper down a little bit? We can't see what you're doing. Uh for this right here? It's not visible. Yeah, like it's like blocked almost. Like you can see half I can see half of it. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Okay. So focal lens for a converging lens. Okay, I'm gonna draw my but let's draw my object first. My object is at four centimeters. So I'm just going to draw it four centimeters away. For a converging lens, I'm going to have to worry about a focal point on the opposite side of the lens. But this is a diverging lens. For a diverging lens, you need to worry about a focal point on the same side as the lens. This has a focal length of negative three. That means there is my focal length. That negative sign is just representing I'm going in the kind of wrong direction, because normally I'd like to go this way. And so you'll put your focal length, you'll put your object. There is no second point for a lens like there is for a mirror. And just like a mirror, I'm going to draw two lines. The first one goes straight across to the lens and then through F. Your second one, for the mirror, it goes through point C, but there's no point C here. Instead of point C is the middle of the lens. I'm going to go straight to that point right in the middle. And wherever they meet, that is where I draw my image. And that's what I want there. Once again, I might do a converging lens instead. If it's a converging lens, make sure you practice those. Question 15 will be questions about that lens. Now, for a mirror, something is real when the image and object are on the same side of it. That's because that's how you use a mirror. When you use a mirror, you reflect things off. For a lens, you look through lenses. Something is real when the image and the object are on opposite sides of a lens. This would be real. This would be virtual. Now, the image and the object are on the same side as each other. Therefore, this is virtual. As for the rest, my image 
is smaller than my object. My object was about a line tall. This guy's about a half line tall. It's not as big. Therefore, it is reduced. And my arrow started pointing up, and my new arrow is also pointing up. So this is upright. Questions, though? Once again, make sure you have a rule. Okay. The last chapter will be chapter eight. Now, I know some of you haven't started the chapter eight homework yet. I highly recommend doing the homework before the exam. It'll make your life easier. You'll know what's going on. But either way, chapter eight was all electricity and magnetism. Um, I know I often try to work in a question about magnets somewhere, but general idea, um, Coulomb's law is almost definitely going to show up, and resistors in parallel and series is almost definitely going to show up, combined with Ohm's law and the laws for power. Um, although I'm gonna, when I start doing those, I'm gonna slide up and get something different instead of that. You can really expect those. Coulomb's law, resistors in parallel and series, and actually really all of this is for resistors in parallel and series. But let me look at the first problem. The first problem last time is what is the forces on two charges of blank and blank respectively if they're separated by this much? If you want to find the force acting on two charges, that is Coulomb's law, where the force is Coulomb's constant Q1, Q2 over R squared. And so what I'll say is the Coulomb's constant, 8.99 times 10 to the ninth um, Coulomb, no, Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. If you don't know that number, that's fine. Once again, oops, that didn't work. Let's try that again. It will be on the front of the thing. Or in your case, on the first page in the, the assignment. The charges, I'll just put in the values. Q1 is negative 3.15 coulombs. Q2 is 2.38 coulombs. And the distance between them was 0.153 meters. And so I'm going to just take that and square it. And it'll give me an answer. Now, I asked, do they attract or repel? This is a positive charge and a negative charge. Like charges repel. If I have a positive charge and a negative charge, if the charges are not the same, they attract. Anytime the charges are the same, if they're both positive or both negative, they repel. Any questions there? Uh, question 17 is often an open-ended one. I often just ask things like, you know, what are the poles of a magnet? What does AC and DC stand for? Uh, last time I said electrical current is the flow of what? Electrical current is the flow of electrons. Um, kind of a simple one. But uh, that I said, those are kind of harder to do. 18, 19, and 20 normally kind of work together. And normally they involve things in parallel or series. And I do expect you to know how to solve for circuits in parallel and series with resistors. Last time, it was in series. And I said, what is the equivalent resistance of the circuit below? Now, it doesn't say it's in series, but I know it's in series just looking at it. Because when I look at it, what I can see is they're all end to end to end. If it's in parallel, the circuit would be battery, resistor, 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 like that. If this is in series, the equivalent resistance is just the sum of the resistors. And so the equivalent resistance is just adding those up. 3 ohms plus 5 ohms plus... 1 ohm. I misread that for a second, I got really confused. Which 3 plus 5 plus 1? 
is 9 ohms. If it's in parallel, do not use that equation. If it's in parallel, use this one. I then asked, what is the current through each resistor? Now, in series, there we go, I wanted this. In series, all resistors have the same current. And so the current through them is going to be the same for all of them. So I'm not going to go and solve for I1, I2, and I3. I'm just going to say the current. If they're in parallel, the voltage will be the same. So if it's in parallel, the voltage is the same. It's going to be easy. If these were in parallel, the answer would be 18 volts. That's the voltage on all of them. If they're in parallel, the voltage is the same as the voltage on the battery. But if they're in series, the current is the same as the equivalent current. What I can do is I can say current, looking at this right here, current is V over all. And the current through each one, I1, I2, and I3, is going to just be the current over the equivalence, which means it's going to be, as I just said, V over all. All 18 volts, the volts of the battery, over the equivalence. That's the current on each one. Does that make sense? Now, 19, what is the voltage through each resistor? Now we're solving for V. If I want to solve for V, I can look at my circle and I got three equations for V. Two of them have P in it. I don't know what P is. So let's not use that one. And I'll say V equals I all, which means V1 is I1 all one or two amps times three ohms to get six volts. V2 is I2 R2, or two amps times five ohms to get 10 volts. And V3 equals I3 R3, or two amps times one ohm to get two volts. Note if I add that up, six plus 10 plus two is 18. That's good, it should be. Question 20, what's the power? If I want to find power, I'll go back to my circle. Power, I have three equations, I squared all, V squared over all, or VI. I can use any of those equations. It doesn't matter which one I use. They all will work. I usually use um, P equals IV, just because I don't want to bother squaring things. If I square things, I'm more likely to make a mistake. And I'll just do each one. P1 equals I1, V1. or 2 amps times 6 volts to get 12 watts. P2 equals I2 V2, or 2 amps times 10 volts to get 20 watts. P, that's not a P. P3 equals I3 V3, or 2 amps times 2 volts to get 4 watts. I normally have things show up like this. As I said, it might be in parallel, it might be in series. You know how to do both. Uh, there's a lot of practice on the homework. The homework is due after the exam. I do acknowledge that fact. I highly recommend doing it before the exam, though, for your own help. I really do feel like the homework is practice for the exam. I'm not just doing it for the sake of making you do it, despite what most people think of me. That's the setup. That's the exam from last semester. As I said, your exam's not going to be identical, but it's going to be kind of similar. Um, I also want to say a lot of people had problems with time. And I find this interesting because I take the exams myself and I time how long I do them. And I have a mental formula that if I can't do it within a certain amount of time, I don't give it to you guys. And I've never had an issue with people running out of time when we had exams in person. But now that I'm doing these exams online, Everyone is saying that doing the actual exam is taking longer. We're giving 15 minutes to upload things. So the, I don't think it's just that. And what a lot of it is, is that people are spending more time flipping through the notes. 
I do not think you should have all your notes open in front of you. You can, but if you want to find an equation, you're going to be going and scrolling through all the PowerPoints. You're going to waste a shit ton of time. Prepare for the exam ahead. Make an equation sheet with just what you need, or maybe just have these pages in front of you. But make a thing with just what you need, because the more time you spend opening up every single notes and every bit of PowerPoint, the more time you waste. So be prepared for the exam. If I didn't, this name's open notes. If I do an open notes exam and give everyone infinite time, everyone should get 100 Because you, if you have infinite time. I'm I give you a time limit for a reason. It's because I want to make sure you know this and you're, it's not just how many files do you search through to find an answer. So that's my one thing about time I want to say. Um, but I do have 10 minutes left. So 10 minutes left. So any questions about the exam in general or anything that someone wants to see me do as a help to prepare for the exam? I'll take either. Nothing? I mean, if you guys don't have anything else, I'll just end early. But I'll happily go cover anything people want to see. OK. Well, if you guys think you got it all, I will stop bothering you and let you be. And um, you can always email me questions or come to my office hours. I got a few between now and then. Um, yeah, if you guys got it, cool. Um, no lab is going to open up this week. So they still have a lab due on Friday, but there won't be a lab that opens on Friday since I'm not covering any new material this week. Um, you still have a homework due Wednesday. And I hope to grade the exam Thursday, uh, after, Thursday morning. I'll email when the exams are graded. Do not work together. Um, I decided in the end to not enforce that you must be on Zoom during the exam. I decided not to be mean about it. But um, yeah, I wrote up some people for cheating and gave them zeros on the exam last time. because it was very obvious they worked together. If I think, if I can tell, and I can normally tell that you worked with someone on this exam, it is an instant zero on the exam. And if you get a zero on the exam, you're gonna have a hard time passing the course. So do not work with people, work by yourself. I will. I will enforce, I will go out of my way to do an academic integrity violation, which also if you get multiples of, you get kicked out of school. If I think, if I know you worked with someone on the exam, I'm telling you right now. Um, I know I'm being harsh today, but this is something I'm very adamant about is that I don't want you cheating. But otherwise I'll help with what I can. Let me know if I can help with anything else. And if you don't have questions, we'll stop there. Have a good day. <laughs>